Good morning. Well, not for all of us. Uh, no joke, about five, four to five percent of people with low back pain, I'm pretty sure you're not having a good morning because discogenically and sitting down, which puts even more pressure on the injured disc. So for 96% of us, this is not going to be an issue, but there was one person who I know is thinking about it. I know because he sent us a question. The question came in from YouTube and it's, I wonder what doctor thinks about ozone nucleoplasty. Ozone nucleoplasty, oh, I love digging in and unpacking new treatments, especially for everything, all spine and joint, but especially when it comes to spine because we have so many areas where we don't have really great treatments. And the idea of injecting something into a disc, specifically for the treatment of discogenic low back pain, is a super, super attractive one that a lot of people have been investigating. So thank you for your question. I was really excited to get it. And we're gonna unpack that, answer everything you ever wanted to know about discogenic low back pain versus radiculopathy. We're gonna look at some literature. Yeah, it turns out to be kind of craptastic, but still we're gonna look at it and guide it. And I've got a brand new pyramid for you. Remember when we talked about the pyramid of evidence before? I got a new pyramid to show. It's the pyramid of acceptance. It's how we know how accepted a procedure is, how we know how to think about something like percutaneous nucleoplasty or ozone nucleoplasty. All that today and more here on Best Practice Live. Good morning, good morning again. I'm very excited. We're gonna look at uh, ozone nucleoplasty, but I wanted to point out here in Arizona, the uh, yellow limes are coming off the trees. Um, these things are most famous for their use here in Phoenix and margaritas, I'm not gonna lie. But uh, don't forget with your anti-inflammatory diet that you can take these limes and juice them and add some chia seeds, pop them in the fridge and have a really cool high energy snack. It's a snack that uh, was originally used by the Tarahumara runners down in Mexico. These guys who could run almost 100 miles a day, really pretty extraordinary stuff. So don't forget, there's some really cool anti-inflammatory snacks out there which are not super fattening and do provide you with really good energy. All right, let's look at today's question. Straight to the graphic. Um, this came from Armand Aliota via YouTube. I wonder what doctor thinks about ozone nucleoplasty. This is a great question. And um, first of all, because ozone nucleoplasty is kind of a new treatment, but also because it allows us to unpack the difference between radiculopathy, which is a disorder of a nerve root, and discogenic low back pain. Discogenic low back pain is low back pain feels like a knife in the back that's being caused by a tear in the annulus. And I threw in some images just to remind you that these are really different things. You know, honestly, this whole area kind of reminds me of uh, a funny saying, you know what would happen if the United States turned from pounds to kilograms overnight? There'd be mass confusion. Get it? <laughs> well, so mass is one thing, but then we have two different names for it. That's not what's going on here. That, that's what I really want to point out. There's, there's so much confusion, even amongst doctors. And a lot of people, when I talk to them about, oh, you know, I'm so disappointed I had this treatment or that treatment and it really didn't work. And then we look, they send in their question and then we look at their MRI. And I think to myself, oh, you poor thing, you had the wrong treatment for the right problem. Like nobody identified what the problem was and you would, it's like that mass issue. Whether you call it pounds or kilos, you're acting like it's the same thing, but what if they're two different things? You can't use the term pound or kilo 
when you're talking about speed or velocity, right? They're, they're different. They're different. You can't say, oh, how fast is that car going? Oh, about 20 pounds. <laughs> no, no. Or 20 kilos? No, right? It's a different, it's a different thing. And so you have to think about it differently. Same thing here. Discogenic low back pain and radiculopathy are not the same thing. And we treat them all the time in medicine like they are. This is never going to happen to you. By the end of watching this video, you're going to know what you need to make sure that this confusion never ruins your year, causes you expensive, unnecessary treatments, and gives you false hope. It's not going to happen to you because you watch this video. So let's, let's unpack it here really quickly. All right, first, radiculopathy. Uh, radic means nerve root and apathy means problem. So this is just Latin for a problem with a nerve root. And how do you get it? Well, you can get it from a bone spur, but most of the time it's from a tear in the annulus, the tough outer part of a disc, causing the nucleus to herniate out and you get a herniated disc. You get a herniated disc. And on this side, we see the nerve root coming out of the spinal canal, going out into the body, and it's shown as yellow. It's not actually, it's white if you look at it in real life. But anyway, it's shown as yellow. And then here on this side, where we have the nerve root going out into the body, it's red. Why is it red? It's red because, let me blow this up a little bit. Yeah. It's red because the nucleus is, has no blood supply, it's foreign to your body, and when that nucleus touches that nerve root, it causes irritation. Now that irritation causes at least three things. First of all, it causes pain, and the pain is, shoots out of your back and down your leg in the distribution of the sciatic nerve. Sorry, I put this on the wrong side, I'll have to switch that. But this is sciatic pain. It shoots out and goes down your back, down the nerve. So some of it is back pain, but most of it is leg pain. Most of it is leg pain. It also causes numbness. It also causes weakness. And if you are a person who watches this show, you know that the normal treatment for this is it's mostly nerve root pain. It's, it's causing numbness and weakness. You see your doctor after three weeks of home care fails you get an MRI which shows the herniated disc and then you get an epidural injection. That's what we're showing here, the needle and the steroid for an epidural injection. That's the standard treatment for radiculopathy. Totally different thing now, apples and oranges, let's talk about this guy, discogenic low back pain. Discogenic low back pain is due to a tear in the disc. It's a tear in the disc right here it can go in a herniated disc, it went all the way through and allowed this stuff out. But these tears can be partial. And that tear causes back pain. It's that, I always think of that psycho, uh, Anthony Perkins, Anthony Hopkins, I can't remember, Anthony Perkins, that knife in the back pain. Um, that pain is due to an annular tear. There's actually been a lot of research about that. And what they did was they took people who MRI showed that annular tear, and in surgery, surgeons nibbled up some pieces of that disc, and then they, they did HPLC, high pressure liquid chromatography. It's a molecular biology technique, really cool lab test, but it allows you to see what kind of proteins are in this stuff. And what these experiments showed, very interesting, was that normally there's no neuropeptides, there's no, there's no, uh, neurotransmitters associated with pain in the annulus. But if you've had an annular tear, there are. Things like substance P. It's one of my favorite, favorite phrases, substance P. It's a neurotransmitter associated with pain. So why would there be substance P in a torn disc but not in an, in an, an intact disc? Well, the answer is, the theory is, we, I mean, no one could ever really prove this, but this is our theory, this is the scientific theory, that when the tear happens, the body tries to heal the disc, and as a result of that healing process, healing tissue in the body is called granulation tissue. That granulation tissue starts to grow in there and heal it, and as it does, it brings with it 
pain fibers. Pain fibers are part of granulation tissue. So they're not part of a normal annulus, but pain fibers are part of granulation tissue. So it's your body's attempt to heal it that causes these granulation tissue to grow in, and that granulation tissue kind of sweeps with it, brings with it inside some, um, some pain fibers. That really fits, right? Why is discogenical back pain worse when you sit down? And we know it is, because we can see it on an MRI. There's a tear in the disc and usually inflammation in the end plates of the bone. So we can, we can tell who's got the anatomy to have it objectively based on the MRI. And we know from these studies that it's in those people, uh, in people with MRIs like that, there are pain fibers in the disc. Well, now you sit down and the pressure in your disc goes up and now you've got pain fibers. What's one of the things that can activate a pain fiber? Well, one thing is uh, chemical activation. That's why non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs work, by the way. But another thing is pressure. If you, uh, if you slammed your finger in the car door, would you go up to your hurt finger and put pressure on it? No, because <laughs> that would hurt like hell, right? So you wouldn't do that, dummy, because it, it would hurt, pressure hurts. Same thing, when you sit down, you're putting pressure on your disc. Well, your disc is hurt, so it hurts. The pressure hurts, sitting hurts. Even waking up in the morning, that inflammation, see, it doesn't, that, that irritation, it doesn't depend on inflammation. It depends on mechanical activation of the disc. So um, think about this for a second then. If that's the case, if you had a herniated disc, let's say you got this guy, and inflammation is what mediates the pain, and you took an anti-inflammatory drug, then you would expect that to reduce the pain. But if you had an annular tear, a knife in the back pain, and this was caused by mechanical activation, not inflammation, and then you took an anti-inflammatory drug, would that help? No, right? It, would, it probably wouldn't help because it's not an inflammatory process that's mediating the pain. So an anti-inflammatory medication doesn't make the slightest bit of sense. Now, this is not esoteric. This is gonna have a lot to do with ozone therapy and injecting it into the disc that we're gonna go over today. In fact, um, let's think about that right now. So if you had this condition and you injected ozone, you put a needle into this disc and injected ozone, and the ozone was anti-inflammatory, would you predict that that would be helpful? Yeah, because the pain is mediated by inflammation. And so if we do something that promotes healing, and organizes inflammation, then we really should get promoting healing. For how long? We don't know. How much ozone do you need to inject? That's something scientists would have to figure out. How, lo how long is the effect gonna last? I think I mentioned that already, we don't know. How much the dose, we don't know. Um, so we could try it and see if it worked, and we're gonna see in a minute, people actually did. But what's interesting is, if we mixed up who we were trying it on, like if we tried it on this guy, would it make sense also to try it on this guy? No, because the issue here is mechanical receptor activation. It's not, so this annular tear is not an inflammatory condition. And so you, there's no reason to expect, it would be irrational to expect that uh, it would work. Could it work? Yeah, of course, any, you know, things, the most surprising things when they turn out to be true are the greatest discoveries. But that's not the issue here. The question is, we wanna, we wanna take a rational approach, of course, and give us the best chance of getting you better. So it doesn't make sense. But what would really be dumb on the part of the investigators would be to mix these two up, right? If we threw a bunch of people in the t study who had this, and then we peppered it with a bunch more who had that, then we'd be comparing apples and oranges and we'd really be, right, shoot ourselves in the head. Because if it didn't work for discogenic pain, and we did this study and there happened to be more than we, you know, we expect 4% of people to have discogenic pain. But if 4% of them 
weren't going to respond to begin with, and they were accidentally more like 20 or 30 percent of the study. This could ruin the whole study. This could ruin the whole study. So it's a really important thing to understand when, you know, this apples and oranges stuff, it's not esoteric. It's a really important thing to understand. So let's, let's get back to, the, to this in a minute and go back to the question. Is intradiscal injection effective? Now, my answer would be, my guess would be, and uh, by guess here, I'm talking about a bias, right? This is my bias, because this is what I'm thinking going in. I'm thinking it could possibly work for herniated disc. It doesn't make a ton of sense because we have much stronger ways than ozone and injecting something into a disc risks causing an infection in the disc, which is discitis, which is just a miserably painful thing. Uh, there's no, the, the patients who I used to just dread uh, seeing, I wanted to see them because they needed help, but I knew there was nothing I could do and they'd be miserable and they would tell me how miserable they were. And my whole job was to try to cheer them on. Hey, you got to get through this. You're going to get better. You're having one of the worst pains on earth. Um, in fact, disc, discitis pain, you know how they teach you to diagnose that when you're in training? The, I re, I'll never forget this. A neurology professor told me, when you go to the door of the room and a patient's laying in bed, if you open the door and the wind caused by the door opening causes the patient's back pain to be worse, they have, dis, they have discitis. Like, the, I mean, it's just anything. It's just miserable. It's discitis. You can't get antibiotics in there. We put them on antibiotics, but it doesn't work. It takes six to 12 weeks to resolve. And it's, it's like being in labor for 12 weeks. It's just nasty and um, hor horrific pain. And, and anyway, that's discitis. And that can happen with intradiscal injection. So my bias going in is, well, why would I, put, why would I give somebody a risk, very small risk? No doubt, very small risk. But why would I give somebody the risk of discitis if I could just do a transforaminal epidural injection, have a known anti-inflammatory steroid, or even stem cell-derived amnion proteins, why would I, growth factors, why would I risk the intradiscal injection? There would have to be a very compelling reason. I'm especially worried because I know that it's not like you buy ozone in the store, in the store from the pharmacy, right? You got a bubble ozone through, you're mixing it, so it's screwball. You're, you're, you're handling something that, in my mind, really radically increases the risk for infection, the risk for contamination, which then is the risk for infection, and the risk for discitis. All right, well, anyway, let's go back to the screen and uh, bring up the, um, the uh, internet. The, I'm going to go to PubMed. PubMed is the uh, American National Library of Medicine. Let's go to their site, and here we've got this big juicy search bar. I'm going to search for intradiscal ozone injection. Intradiscal ozone injection. Why? Because I don't want to get intradiscal inside a disc ozone. That's what I'm curious about. Injection. I don't want it there any way other than injected. Efficacy of intradiscal ozone therapy with or without periforaminal steroid injection on lumbar disc herniation, a double-blind controlled study. Ooh, nice. Double-blind controlled study. I want to see that. So what, is, what are we looking at? Double-blind means, um, means people don't know whether they're getting steroid injected, and the, inject, the investigator doesn't know whether they're injecting steroid or whether they're injecting, um, or whether they're injecting uh, uh, the ozone infusion. And then control means I've got one group to compare to another group. So that's, those are two things I really want to see, double randomized, double-blind controlled study. All right, so what they do, intradiscal ozone could be given to patients who don't respond to, con, to lumbar disc herniation, yes, yes. Prospective double-blind randomized, yes. 65 patients, ooh, that's not very many. So the, there's, when you have small sample sizes, there's a lot of room for uh, error, especially in diseases that wax and wane and get better on their own, like disc herniation. So what's the probability a disc herniation is going to resolve by itself? Around 90, 92 to 95%, 94%-ish. So really, really hard when we're looking at people who are very likely to get better on their own 
it can be really, really uh, noisy to pull out of that data people who actually got better as a result of the treatment. So I'm worried. And then they followed the Oswestry Disability Index, the visual analog scale. Those are good measures. They did in all the injections under C-arm. That's a minimally minimal requirement, but it's necessary. Results. Significant improvements were observed in pain, disability, and quality of life in both groups. So transferaminal epidural steroid injection, which is pretty much the standard treatment in the U.S. for lumbar disc herniation, those people did well. And then people who also just got intradiscal ozone, they did well as well. Uh, mean pre-injection was not significantly different between the two groups when assessed at these months. And uh, similarly, they followed on the parameters. Um, Look, I got to tell you, uh, this is idiotic. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I Look, science is really hard. And getting published what randomized controlled trial in a journal called Pain Physician, um, doing science is really admirable. And I have a lot of respect for anybody who, who does it. But this was stupid from the go. And... Uh, even though I respect these guys for trying, this was idiotic. Epidural steroid injection doesn't change the course of a disease. When someone says, oh, I had an epidural and my pain went away for three years, that's not what happened. I had an epidural and my pain went away for five days, but during that five days, my body resolved enough of the inflammation that I was able to go on and the pain did not recur. It's a really, really valuable technique. No one Saying I had an epidural injection and then my disc uh, went away is as dumb as saying I had an epidural and then I had a baby, so the epidural caused me to have a baby. No. <laughs> like, like, you were going to have the baby anyway, but you got pain control from the epidural. Same thing with the disc herniation. You were going to get better anyway. We know that for sure. We've done these studies have been done over the years many, many times. We know this. You were going to get better anyway, but the epidural caused your pain to be controlled, which is a really, really, really good thing. We want that pain to be controlled. So don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking on the epidural, but epidural injection doesn't make you pregnant and have a baby, and it doesn't resolve disc herniations. Epidural injection relieves pain for about five days. So now you're going to, as your control group, compare intradiscal injection of ozone. And you know that the epidural injection didn't make any difference. So look, people, th that's why I mean, this is so stupid. This study was designed to show nothing exactly that it did. And then they published it with literally these parameters. So... It just doesn't make sense. I'm sorry, but anyway, uh, trash. Trash science, bad science, uh, waste of time. So no information there. All right, how about this, this next one? Um, intradiscal ozone therapy for lumbar disc herniation. Ooh, this looks good. Uh, the rationale behind uh, ozone injection enlisted by mechanical receptor of the nerve root, which is associated with inflammation. Yes, agreed. This study is aimed to determine the effect of intradiscal ozone injection on pain score and satisfaction of patients with low back pain secondary to disc herniation. Ah, uh, that's a little weird, right? So we're talking about people with radiculopathy. Radiculopathy is mostly in the leg. So why are they talking about back pain? That's not, that's an incidental component of radiculopathy and the primary component of discogenic pain. So this is, remember when we were talking about it, what if you accidentally, I'm kind of worried about that here. Stupidity, it's everywhere. <laughs> like, guys, you, you want to study people with radiculopathy, not discogenic low back pain. It doesn't make sense to study intradiscal ozone for discogenic low back pain. It's a mechanical, you should have screened for people with exam confirmation with weakness and numbness in the distribution of the nerve shown to be irritated by MRI, right? Not low back pain, not low back pain. Ah, crazy. And then they do this injection. So they prepped and draped, the intradiscal oxygen was mixed. They did it under fluoroscopy. Pain sores were assessed at baseline and then one, three, six, 12, and 24 months after injection. 
okay, I'm sorry, but we're looking at the same stupidity. Intradiscal uh, therapy was determined to provide improved outcomes in patients with a single level of bulging and protrusion. So, oh my God. I mean, there's so much junk science I just don't understand. So first of all, there was no single level requirement in their patient selection. Maybe it's there and they didn't mention it, but if it's there, why didn't they mention it? They're studying the wrong symptom for the disease, so they're accumulating a population. There's no control group in this, so it's it's improved compared to what? Com compared to yellow limes, because there's no <laughs> there's no it's it's just stupid. Like it just it doesn't make sense and ah, junk science. Not helpful. Not an answer to my question. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, YouTube questioner. I'm sorry we're getting into this. Compression, comparison of percutaneous intradiscals and with larger disc decompression and discogenic low back pain. Okay, I kind of feel like these guys know what they're doing. So first of all, they're looking at discogenic low back pain. They're comparing intradiscal ozone injection with laser disc decompression. So at least they're comparing apples to apples. And then they injected 6 ml of ozone, 30 grams per ml. So that seems to be some kind of standard. Let's see what they showed. Comparison, um, is this a good journal? Uh, I don't know, what's the journal? Journal of Pain Research, I'm actually not familiar with it, but that doesn't mean anything. Just because I don't know you doesn't mean you're not awesome. In fact, I'm hoping there's a lot of awesome people I don't know. Um, intervertebral disc herniation with pressure on the surrounding neural structures is one of the most important causes of low back pain, sometimes leads to open surgery. Reducing the pressure inside the disc with interdiscal inventions such as laser radiation or ozone injection is a minimally invasive method and an alternative to surgery with satisfactory results. These two methods were compared. I See, to me, intradiscal ozone is about controlling inflammation. So they don't see it that way. I, I, these guys are smart. They obviously know what they're talking about. They're looking at discogenic low back pain. They, they get that there's radiculopathy due to herniated disc and then there's back pain due to annular tear and they're talking about the latter but they have a different view of it. In their view, it may be the pressure in the disc and somehow ozone, which I'm thinking of as organizing tissue in an anti-inflammatory fashion, they're thinking of it as a way to reduce that pressure. But anyway, we're speaking the same language and I, I can tell from what they're saying that they know what they're doing. So I'm interested to see what these smart guys came up with. Results, there was no difference between the two groups. Uh, looking at the oswestry, okay. So that's too bad because um, if there had, that might have opened up a new uh, definition of treatment. We don't know why this happened, but one possibility is that the, um, the ozone is an anti-inflammatory and really doesn't reduce pressure, but we don't know. All right, so there's a lot of additional articles, and this one goes back to 2012, which is, you know, frankly, so, um, so long ago. I'm, I'm not sure how valid or... or um, or uh, true it is. All right, so we've gone through the medical literature now. We've seen the primary reports, and the literature is shite, right? There's nothing, there's nothing in there to really tell us. And so we're left with a procedure that we don't have any great information on. And now the question for me is, would I recommend it or not? And to answer that question, by the way, uh, there was a pretty gigantic yawn when I presented the um, pyramid of evidence. Uh, you guys just aren't interested in that. It's not as bad as the uh, odds ratio. You know, I put out a YouTube short on the odds ratio that got zero views. Not even my mom looked at it. <laughs> zero. I, the, the hatred of the odds ratio by you people is really, I just don't, it's, it's really extraordinary because honestly that odds ratio would make your life a lot better. But anyway, okay, fine. I'm not here to talk about the odds ratio anymore because it's obviously intensely boring to you. Similarly, I'm not here to bore you. I want to help you lead better, fuller lives. I want to help you answer your questions. So I'm not going to talk about the pyramid of evidence today, but I haven't given up on you. I got a new pyramid 
And I want to try this new pyramid and see what you think. Um, check this out. Let me get this big. Hold on. Hang on, people. I've got, um, yeah, let me just get out of this and go back in because it looks like I'm on some kind of mega size here. Presentation slides, yes, sir, that's what I want. Oh, I see. There we go. Okay, I, this is a lot of work, but it's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth it. We gotta get to this slide. Okay, check out this new infographic. Let's see what you think. This is the new pyramid of acceptance. And at the bottom level, bottom is the lowest level, is this procedure is offered or recommended by a doctor. And there are definitely people, pain management doctors in the community who are willing to do intradiscal ozone injection. So it's definitely here. Is it supported by the medical literature? No. We just went through the medical literature and there's no randomized controlled trial uh, looking at it for either discogenic pain or radiculopathy. So there's no, there's really nothing to, to recommend it. So I'd have to say we're at this level to begin with. Just for yucks, let's talk about, is it recommended by published guidelines? The, um, the professional societies, like all the pain management doctors get together, and all the neurosurgeons, all the orthopedic spine surgeons, they all powwow and then look at the literature, and they'll put out guidelines on different interventions. And I'm not aware of any guidelines that recommend or don't recommend um, intradiscal injection of uh, ozone, so no. Is it approved by Medicare? No. Medicare will make their own decision based on their own panel of experts. And then the commercial health insurance companies, oftentimes they just copy the Medicare coverage recommendations, but on whether or not coverage should be provided for a certain, whether or not there's adequate evidence. And the answer there is no. So no, 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 no. We're down here. Just because there's some doctor who will do it is not enough evidence for me to recommend it. So long answer to your question, but the answer is eh, no, I don't recommend intradiscal injection of ozone for the treatment of anything, not herniated disc, not discogenic low back pain. I'd love to be wrong because we desperately need treatments for discogenic low back pain. We really don't have, uh, we've got denervation now, um, a little, you know, that's new, so we're kind of waiting to see how it goes. There's the old treatment of fusion, which seemed like, you know, detonating a new uh, bomb to kill a mosquito. It's just, it's just like the, the treatment seems out of proportion to the problem. We can treat that discogenic low back pain with uh, stem cell injection into the disc. That's one um, haven't seen good evidence for, but can't say I'd recommend it, but I would say, uh, if I were you, I'd think about it. If I were an alternative person and I wanted to try something, I desperately wanted to try something, that's what I would, that would that's where I would uh, kind of uh, grind all my desperation into hope and try that. But um, other than that, I don't have much. And I don't have anything else to say, which means we're at the end. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. It's really a pleasure to have you on Best Practice Live. And we're here for you. If you got any questions, uh, please click through the link and submit. And otherwise, I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. For Best Practice Live, I'm Dr. Dan Lieberman. Have a great day. If you have a question you would like answered on Best Practice Live, there are three ways to ask. Leave a comment on any of our social channels, click the link to our website and complete the submission form, or call us at 602-256-2525. The more information you can give us, the better we can answer your question. So please contact us and we can walk you through uploading your imaging to a secure server.
Please like and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with information about your spine and joint health. Lastly, be sure to check out new episodes every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, where we answer all your questions.